Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again after an extended hiatus with Jonathan Armstrong. Welcome back, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Tom. Great to see you again. So for our audience in who have just come out of the rocks they may be living under, the United Kingdom had an election on Friday, and we have a new UK government. Uh, the greatest wipeout in the recorded history of UK governments, with the Tories sweeping to power, excuse me, being swept from power, losing uh, or Labour taking over 400 seats in Parliament. Um, I can't remember what the final count was, but I think 119, 120 seats for the Tories, and the changes have already started. So, Jonathan, I was wondering if you might kind of open your remarks today with uh, just the, the gravity and history of this election, and then maybe what it might mean for our compliance contemporaries here in the United Kingdom or here in the United States and uh, across the world. Yeah, I'm happy to, Tom. I mean, I think, um, I mean, certainly regarded, I think, already as a as a refreshing change, whatever your politics. I think that people thought that the uh, Conservative government were sort of limping along like a ship with a hole in the side. And I think already we've seen more optimism. I think it helps that um, that the England football team did better on Saturday as well. But the mood certainly today, as we record this Monday, is better than it was uh, this time last week. I think that um, we've already seen the new government hit the ground running. I think all of the cabinet ministers went, uh, given that the king only appointed uh, Sir Keir Starmer at about one o'clock, the cabinet met at around two o'clock. They were given their missions in the main, the five principal missions that the government's going to have. People, uh, uh, the, there was a cabinet meeting, as I said, in the, in the afternoon. Uh, people started work the same day. The foreign secretary flew off within two or three hours to have meetings in Europe. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer uh, went up to Scotland. He's currently in Northern Ireland. And we've had announcements this morning on things like fiscal issues, like zoning, um, what we call planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And maybe the first thing to say is I think from an enforcement point of view, I think this will be a, a government that knows its way around compliance and knows its way around enforcement. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer, the new prime minister, was uh, at the same university as me a couple of years. He's a couple of years older than me. He um, is somebody who knows the criminal justice system incredibly well. He was a defence barrister. He did some vaguely compliance-related cases whilst at the bar, including famously the case um, brought by McDonald's against some activists over wording that they had in a leaflet about McDonald's uh, CSR policies. So he did that litigation. He then went into uh, running the Crown Prosecution Service, the, the sort of central prosecutory body for most prosecutions in the UK. Uh, and obviously it was the CPS there after Sir Keir's time that brought the first prosecutions under the Bribery Act. So he's somebody that knows his way around the criminal justice system. He knows about enforcement. And I think this is likely to be a more um, experienced government when it comes to those sort of issues, despite having been out of office for so long. So we have talked about previously the now entrenched SFO director. We used to call him the new one, the most recent one. And I think uh, you and I uh, have applauded his actions going forward. Do you see a healthy interaction between the current SFO director and the new government or something different? I do. My gut feel is I think they'll both be talking similar language. Um, when Sakia was uh, um, 
DPP, as I say, running the Crown Prosecution Service. I think he was pretty straightforward. Uh, I get that as a vibe from the current SFO director. Current SFO director has obviously tried to step up bribery enforcement. He's done dawn raids for the first time in ages. And I, and I see that um, uh, definitely matching. I think one of the first challenges will be to look at the PPE scandal. And again, we've had announcements on that this morning. Um, the uh, Let me just get the figure right. Uh, the Labour government uh, uh, says that there are 7.2 billion sterling worth of contracts from Boris Johnson's era that need investigating as they may be potentially corrupt. There are already some a Tory party donors who are under investigation for their role in some of those contracts. And the new administration say that that is likely to be a priority. So if anybody here is watching or listening who's involved in healthcare, particularly involved in uh, the National Health Service, the NHS in the UK, I think that's likely to be an area of scrutiny Labour say that they are going to appoint a new COVID corruption commissioner who will be the lead on looking at that £7.2 billion pounds worth of money that went astray. But we can expect that, I think, to work hand in hand with the SFO. So I wouldn't be surprised if that uh, uh, corruption commissioner was trying to use uh, the SFO's dawn raid powers, for example, or the powers that the SFO has to demand documents from people. Bear in mind, of course, that we've had recent changes in the law in the UK, in part to correct the uh, um, issues that we had about getting documents from non-UK entities. So I think that's likely to be a, a, a real area of focus. And I think, I, I think, Starmer and those close to him probably get the fact that um, that bribery enforcement can be profitable. You know, the SFO previously brought in more money than it cost to bring in that money through fining corporations, notably uh, Rolls-Royce and um, Airbus. And I think we can expect that sort of common sense view to continue. I'd say two other things. The new business secretary is also a former solicitor, so I think he gets the legal system. And we have a Lord Chancellor who runs the justice system, um, who's also a lawyer. And whilst that might sound novel and obvious that the person running the whole system should have legal experience, it wasn't obvious to... Uh, Boris Johnson and those who came before. So I think there are more uh, sensible, grown-up people in those positions. And I think like uh, the likely result is, is more enforcement, particularly about bribery, because, uh, you know, there are obviously questions to be answered about uh, what went on under Boris Johnson's watch. In uh, related, of course, to bribery and corruption are <clears throat> trade controls, customs, uh, economic sanctions. Uh, that includes everything from uh, sanctions uh, involving Russian individuals to things like the Weaker Forced Labor Prevention Act in the United States. Where might you see labor taking that arena? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. There's a perception that some Russian uh, connected individuals were missed off the sanctions list because they had donated to the uh, Conservative Party. It's public knowledge that Boris Johnson went from a uh, EU level meeting on sanctions to the holiday home of uh, one of those individuals, a former uh, KJ, KGB official, and some of that group of people were 
donors and were close to the outgoing um, uh, uh, party. So I think there will be less hesitancy to include some of those individuals in the Russian sanctions list. So I think we could expect that list to be expanded. And some of the differences between, for example, the US list and the UK list might fall away as a result. I think as far as uh, Uyghur measures are concerned, then I think there is a likelihood of change there. The new um, uh, second in command at the Treasury, uh, Darren Jones MP, was the chair of a influential parliamentary committee. That parliamentary committee investigated supply chain issues, forced labour out of China, etc. It proposed, uh, amongst other things, that the uh, that the import uh, situation changed to be more similar to the US in terms of goods being seized at ports and importers or, or the uh, being asked to assume, provide assurances that no forced labour was used. And so Darren Jones's committee proposed that. Now Darren Jones is effectively in a position to do something about it and to carry out the recommendations that his committee made. So I don't think um, Labour are looking at things that they call 100 days priorities. So what would they do in the first 100 days? I don't think it's a 100 day priority. I may be wrong, but I think it's a first parliament priority. So if anybody's involved in importing goods to the UK, I think they'd be wise to assume that supply chain laws similar to those in the U US, particularly relating to forced labour, are uh, likely to come in in the UK as well. How about uh, things like AI governance, AI enforcement, looking at the ubiquitousness of the major tech companies in this space? Do you see a, a, a continuation or uh, a change? Yeah, again, I, I see a toughening of the regime there. There's some interesting things going on. It was perceived that Rishi Sunak was light on AI regulation. And the perception was that that's because he thought that was where his future career lay. Um, uh, it, it, it was said that he has aspirations to move eventually to the west coast of the US uh, alongside his wife. Well, whatever that position, I think there's likely to be a tougher position on AI under Labour. And I think that will take maybe three steps. First of all, there'll be a new centralised office, which will look at the use of AI. And some aspects of that will be how government uses AI, but other elements of that will be educating existing regulators on who to use their powers. Uh, how to use their powers. Now, obviously, already a number of UK regulators have the power to look at how AI is used. That will include the Competition and Markets Authority, looking at it from an antitrust competition law point of view, looking at fairness issues, the same as the FTC would in the US. Uh, we also have local trading standards officers who have powers similar to the FTC around fair and deceptive practices, this sort of thing. And then we have the Information Commissioner's Office, the data regulator, who's already brought one AI investigation against a US corporation, Clearview, which ended uh, somewhat unsatisfactory from the ICO's point of view. But we'll now have this new coordination hub, which will explain to regulators how central government thinks AI can be regulated. And then the third step I see is, is uh, possibly a new uh, set of uh, UK AI laws. And obviously it's very early to say, we're only, what, 72 hours in, 
but I would have thought that they will be looking closely at the EU AI Act. I think there is a template to use there. The Act could, the EU legislation could be simplified. And of course, the EU legislation won't come in until 2026. Given the size of the majority, as you explained, Tom, that Labour has, and given that the Lib Dems, who now are the third party, I think are broadly sympathetic to looking um, in, in more detail at, at AI, whatever direction the Conservative Party takes, I think there'll be a broad consensus for toughening up some of the downsides of AI. And it wouldn't surprise me if the UK tried to get similar legislation to the EU AI Act with a fair wind. It could be a similar time frame to bring it to the statute book because there wouldn't be so much process involved in the UK, you know, as the, as the EU has already gone through. And if I'm uh, Keir Starmer, I might be thinking that's a good way to show more unity with the EU. I think the UK will try and move closer to the EU in terms of things like tariffs, in terms of things like trading. Obviously, there's a big issue over uh, Northern Ireland post-Brexit. And I think the new administration will try and reach a, reach a hand of friendship over the channel to the EU. It's interesting that David Lammy, the new foreign secretary, spent his Saturday doing that. You know, the man, almost nobody who followed the election, including obviously politicians, didn't sleep Friday night. And to think that uh, he's not even celebrated the victory, but, you know, with zero hours sleep, he's got on a plane, had gone to talk to uh, governments in the EU about, uh, you know, what the French might call a rapprochement. Well, I think that shows what a high priority it is for uh, sensible relations with the EU to be restored. And so passing uh, AI legislation, which mirrors that in the EU, might be a good way of emphasising that, that uh, fraternal bond with the EU. Jonathan, one of the senses I'm getting out of the EU is they're very concerned with size simply because of size or big because it's big in terms of antitrust or anti-competitive enforcement actions. Uh, would the UK have a, a sim view that in a similar vein or is anti-corruption, excuse me, anti-competitiveness viewed a little bit differently in the United Kingdom, at least in terms of size? No, I, th I think that's a good observation. I think that the CMA is already doing some things with uh, EU counterparts. And there was, I think, a sort of what you might call a cooling off after Brexit. My sense is that the CMA and the European Commission are now talking to each other uh, more. There have been simultaneous dawn raids in the UK and the EU, and they, there is definitely a concern about AI. So some of the issues that we've talked about before, that there's a concentration of Gen AI, particularly in the hands of a few large US-based tech corporations, that's a concern. Training data seems to be uh, a distorted market. You know, it is said that depending on who you believe, somewhere between 80 and 90% of Gen AI models are trained on data coming from the same organization. So I think that looks and smells like a monopoly or an oligopoly. And I think that's something that the CMA are likely to pick up on, possibly in cooperation with uh, uh, the European Commission and regulators in the EU if there is more of a um, joined up uh, enforcement agenda on both sides of the channel. Jonathan, what about more traditional topics under uh, GDPR or the UK equivalent of data privacy and data protection? 
Uh, again, I, I, I sense that there are going to be some slightly uh, changed ideas here. The um, the last administration was trying to uh, row back somewhat on some uh, GDPR provisions. I think that was always a really delicate um, thing to pull off because the UK relies on what's called an adequacy decision. It, you know, UK legislation needs to be broadly equivalent to EU legislation to have that safe transfer of data between the EU and, and, and the UK. The uh, last administration had proposed a new uh, bill to look at data protection that had some controversial provisions in it. When uh, one parliament goes in the UK, we have a process where uh, um, senior um, politicians from both of the main parties get together and agree which bills can survive for the last 24 hours, 48 hours of the parliament, and, and they get pushed through. The data protection legislation wasn't one of those on that list, which suggests that there's still some opposition. And by the way, there was opposition again from the Lib Dems uh, to that legislation. So my guess is that we will see some changes to data protection legislation, but I think it will not be as all encompassing as the bill proposed by the Tories. I think we will get changes to areas like research, but there were some changes for example, to the treatment of immigration data, which were basically signals to the pro-Brexit lobby that the UK was still going to be tough. And it may well be that some of those controversial provisions are, uh, are removed from the bill when it comes back round again. So I would expect to see some changes, but not as wholesale as the last administration proposed. And again, if I'm right in my theme, that a lot of this will be done with an eye to better relationships with the EU, I would expect more consideration to be given to the adequacy decision and making sure that no changes were made which jeopardise that adequacy decision. And I think if that process is going to happen, that's, that's definitely to be welcomed. Jonathan, let me move to a little bit different area of more domestic, perhaps, UK, which is employment and labor law. And in the era of work from home, or at least uh, <clears throat> sort of remote or other hybrid types of models, uh, do you see the UK uh, new government moving towards uh, greater protections for workers or greater rights for workers or greater work-life balance for workers? or things along those lines? Yeah, I do. I think the Labour Party traditionally has been funded by <laughs> trade unions, and as a result, it's often had pro-employee policies. Now, obviously, since you know the Blair era, um, that funding uh, reduced in, 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 in real terms, and also, I think the uh, the Labour Party's reliance on unions is less than it was, but have no doubt that some Labour MPs still receive funding from trades unions, and they still are certainly more of a trade union friendly party than the Conservative Party. Having said all of that, you, you know, one of the first big showpiece events this morning uh, was with the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, you know, welcoming businesses and telling them that they were going to be uh, involved in the development of, of policy. But I think we will see more pro-worker legislation, and that might be uh, looking at, again at things like maximum working hours. And one of the things that I think is almost certain to happen is some sort of regulation around what's called the right to disconnect. 
So in some countries in mainland Europe, there is legislation saying, for example, that employees have the right not to check their emails after 5.30, let's say. Uh, I think there was originally a proposal that, that would be hard and fast law. I think it might end up being some sort of law where employers might have to consult with employees over things like work-life balance. And of course, this often disproportionately affects US corporations because we all know how it works in that often US corporations decide, you know, an executive in a US corporation decides that she wants to clear her desk at five o'clock on a Friday, you know, in New York, that means that she passes on tasks or asks questions of colleagues in Europe at 10 p.m. on their Friday night. So the perception is that U.S. corporations particularly are bad at re respecting work-life balance and asking employees to contribute to Teams calls, to reply to emails outside of their contracted working hours. And I think we can expect some sort of action there from the new government. Whether that be a hard and fast law to say, you know, you can't ask somebody to answer emails, you know, one hour after their contracted time, I don't think it'll go that far. But I think there'll definitely be an attempt to rebalance the relations between employees and employers and get away from this perceived always on culture that US corporations are said to adopt. I think you're muted, Tom. Good luck, is all I have to say on that issue. <laughs> uh, so, Jonathan, what? Maybe take a step back and, and help us understand psychologically what do you think it means for not simply a new administration, but really a, ma a massive turnover at the uh, parliamentary level? Yeah. And does it? I mean, the UK, UK population really wanted a change and that um, I don't want to say it's going to be revolutionary changes, not the Labour Party of 50 years ago, but perhaps an evolutionary set of steps. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, good sense there. So, um, so the first thing to say is that there will inevitably be some delay. Now, the new administration, as I said, has hit the ground running. Almost every minister uh, has been out and doing things. You know, we've got a long running dispute at the NHS. That call was made to the uh, doctor's representatives w within about an hour of the uh, cabinet being formed. So there's been lots of progress early on. But we've got about 350-ish new MPs coming into Parliament for the first time. They arrived uh, yesterday, Sunday, but there's a whole process for them to be allocated an office, for them to locate the right staff, for them to be hired. A lot of their staff are hired by Parliament, not by them personally. So there's all sorts of stuff around, you know, the boring stuff about uh, pre-employment screening, and employment contracts being issued, security clearances. You know, one of my daughters worked in Parliament. I think uh, it can take maybe six weeks for you to get your parliamentary pass in regular times. And these aren't regular times. You know, if you think that we've got about 350 new MPs coming in, that might equate to about 1,500 new staff. So uh, to security vet people like that's going to take time. So we've got to be understanding, I think, if the new parliamentary system isn't up and running quickly because there's a lot of process to go through. You know, there aren't enough officers to go around. So who's going to share with who? There are all sorts of processes on protocols as to who gets to offer share, who gets the best officers, et cetera, et cetera. But, but all of that has to be uh, sorted through. At the same time, 
some of the new ministers will be learning their briefs. My other daughter is a civil servant. She's had her briefing from uh, their new minister uh, today. Um, again, you know, exceptionally quick out of the blocks for the new minister to be doing the rounds and meeting her staff. But clearly, that new minister has got to learn her brief. She's got to learn her department. And we already know that some who've uh, taken office have had some somewhat nasty surprises. You know, just as you've had in the US, there's all sorts of jokes about changes in administration, you know, people opening desk drawers and there being a note saying, congratulations, there's no money left, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all those uh, surprises to come as well. So I think it will, I, I don't think it'll be a revolution as such. I'd say that this, um, the new administration l looks somewhat more left wing than the Blair government of 97, perhaps by background, but I think it'll end up being similar in some respects. And the other purely personal point of view I have on this is that the other, um, the other big development in the election was reform. You know, there used to be the pro Brexit party, more right wing than the traditional, uh, the traditional home of the Conservative Party. So you write in your introduction that there was a, a little bit of a squeeze on the Conservative Party, both from the right, from reform, and from the left, from Labour and the Lib Dems. There's a real battle, I think, for the middle ground in UK politics. The Lib Dems obviously had a you know, great success in this election, uh, as did Labour in terms of seats, not necessarily in terms of popular vote. I worry that the uh, Conservative Party will abandon the centre ground because they'll want to be more right wing, because they'll perceive that their real threat is reform led by Nigel Farage. You're shortly to get the benefit of Mr. Farage, who's coming over apparently to help Trump in his campaign. Uh, and, and, and I think there'll be a sort of a move to, to what I'd call uh, right wing policies from what's left of the Conservative Party. And I think that will discourage Labour from moving to the left because traditionally the party in the middle wins. And Blair understood that very well and Mandelson, his, his uh, sidekick who did things like election strategy. I'd be surprised if Starmer didn't understand that. So I don't think this will be a radically left-leaning government. I think this will be a government that tries its best to occupy the centre ground, knowing that the Conservative Party is likely to move to the right. And so, you know, as I said, very early days, but a lot of the signs that I've seen in the first 72 hours back up that theory as well. Um, so again, we'll... We'll wait to see how, uh, how this new administration copes, but I am not as fearful as some are for a, you know, an outright leftist government. Uh, I, I think that um, that we won't see that much change on some key issues. And obviously, the other thing that there's lots of debate over is the conflict in Israel. Um, I, I don't see so much change there. Um, Kia Starmer's wife is of uh, Jewish heritage. There are people of Jewish heritage like uh, Ed Miliband, uh, whose mother, I believe, was a ho Holocaust survivor in government. Uh, there is a move by some towards the left of the uh, Labour Party to, uh, to, to, to be 
very anti-Israel. Some of those, like former leader Jeremy Corbyn, have been expelled from the Labour Party. Uh, some of them stood against the Labour Party on a pro-Gaza ticket. But again, we get back to the fact that Starmer's majority is significant, that he doesn't necessarily have to do a deal with them. He doesn't ha necessarily have to offer them a seat round the table. So I don't see substantial changes in key areas like that. And again, the Ukraine, very quick out of the blocks. The new UK defence minister uh, was in uh, Ukraine at the weekend, visiting hospitals, visiting the wounded, finding out on the ground what the situation is. So again, I, I, I expect the UK's support for Ukraine to be unwavering as well. Well, Jonathan, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I'm sure we'll be able to follow up on these topics uh, in due course. Look forward to it, Tom. Great to chat.